Well, without any sort of warning whatsoever, we jump forward about 20 years in time from where we left off last week. We were in Daniel chapter four uh, last Sunday and, and we were looking at it and we saw the king of Babylon at that time, a man named Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe you just had that passage read for us and who's this Belshazzar? We've been learning about Nebuchadnezzar's life and, and how God's working through him. Well, in chapter four, the king at the time was still Nebuchadnezzar, and and he was this king who had the most powerful empire at the time, and he gave in to the temptation that that plagues all of us, that of pride. He he looks at all of us and he says, look at my power, look at my kingdom, look at all of this, and it's come from the work of my hand, by my authority, by my power this has occurred. And we see in this moment that because he did not humble himself before God, the most high God, that God actually humbled him. And we get to the end of the chapter where where all of that is undone as he does turn and he praises this most high God. Well, following that, we jump about 20 years after the death of Nebuchadnezzar to a time when his descendant, uh, Belshazzar, is king over the land. And it's about 70 years since the book of Daniel first started, 70 years after Daniel and his companions were ripped from their home and brought in exile to the land of Babylon. And at this time, this king, Belshazzar, is throwing this massive feast. It says a thousand people are there. And there's so much food, there's so much uh, wine that's being had, probably a little bit too much wine that's that's being had. And what's really interesting is is the timing of this feast. Because if you read to the end of Daniel chapter 5, you see that that very night, Babylon will fall. This king will die. Why are they throwing this massive feast when the enemies are at the gate? Well, I think it's precisely because the enemies are at the gate that this feast is being held. Uh, what, what we have here is that this, this king is throwing this celebration where, with all of his closest supporters, all of his closest allies, where they're all getting drunk in the face of death. And that happens over verses one through six that were just read for us. As you read later on in in Daniel chapter 5, we're told that this king, Belshazzar, suffers from the very thing that his ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar, did, that of pride, that he too thinks that he has all this power, all this authority. And so throwing this feast at this time, well, I think it shows us how proud he truly is. As they're throwing this celebration here, it comes with these questions of, yeah, the enemies are there, but what can they do against us? With our walls? With, all, with our might, what could they possibly do against mighty Babylon? But there's also a, a little bit more that I think goes with this as well. That he's gathering his closest supporters and, and there's a bit of, of a time to boost their, their support for him, their encouragement in him. I mean, why else would he, would he call for these vessels uh, that were taken out of God's temple? Why, why else would he call for them to be used in the ceremony? That was, that was a, a terrible uh, thing to do even at that time. Well, he takes these things and he's, he's boasting in their gods, the, the gods of, of, of iron, uh, of wood, of, of all of these different materials, praising all of them. There, there's a bit of propaganda that comes with this. It's a bit of like, you remember how our gods defeated the supposed great God of of the Jewish people? Well, surely they're going to do the same thing for us again now. And then we get to this part. As as these fingers of a hand start writing on the wall, and it has this really sobering effect in more ways than one for this king at this time. Uh, the, the descriptions of how he's responded are so vivid. His limbs are shaking, his face goes white as he goes from this, this drunken dinner to a desperate declaration in verses seven through nine. These words appear, and, and while they're words in his language, he knows the words. They're, they're various uh, words for weights and measurements and, and money at the time, uh, but he doesn't know why they're appearing. What, what is the meaning of this? And so he calls all the wise men in the area to come and tell them, what does this mean? And he gives them this incredible offer, this royal reward. Anyone who does this will be made third in command in the entire nation. And yet with that bright, sparkly carrot dangled out in front of them, none of them are able to do this. But then when all seems lost, the queen mother arrives and she remembers someone who has done the impossible. 
Someone who's been able to do things like this before. When, when all else failed, there was this one person who was always able to come through. And the queen mother remembers Daniel. And this is verse is uh, 10 and 12. And what's really interesting to me, we've had this entire series that we've called Winsome Living, looking at the lives of Daniel and his companions in this culture, in this society that doesn't value God or what God calls us to value. And yet they're living faithfully in the midst of that. And we appreciate this because we are living in a culture that does that as well. So how can we follow their example of winsome living in our culture? And here, it's really subtle, it's really small, but once again, we see the results of living faithfully for God. That this woman remembers that Daniel was able to do these things, that through uh, this incredible spirit, the spirit of the gods that's within him, he was able to do the impossible when others could not. And yes, I'm not saying she has perfect faith. In fact, I'm not saying she has any faith. But there's still something remarkable that she was able to recall God has done something in this person. That by him living faithfully for this God, by him... Uh, responding and, and trusting in this God over all these other things, that that is something that stands out to her. The impact of his faithfulness is evident in her. And so Daniel's called to come before this king to give this uh, meaning and reading of these words that, that are, uh, the reading and meaning of these words that, that are show up. And this is verses 13 through 28. It's kind of the bulk of what's happening. And so the, the same offer is given. Are you the one who's able to do this? Can you tell me what these words mean? And if so, uh, you'll get to be third in command of, of the entire nation. And faithful Daniel, always faithful Daniel, says, you can keep your offer. I'm not going to be bought or influenced. I'm not going to change my response based off of you offering to give this to me. I'm going to stand firm to what's true. And what's true is this king. That while your ancestor, Nebuchadnezzar, was humbled by God and he praised the Most High God in response, that he acknowledged that it's not in him, not, not in any king, not in any nation that real power and authority comes from, but it's the Most High God who rules over the kingdom of men. Because you have that as your, your example and you have not followed in Nebuchadnezzar's footsteps, that's why these words have appeared. And this is what he says the words mean in verse uh, 24. He said, then this, uh, uh, then from his presence, from God's presence, the hand was sent. And this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Many, many tekel and parson. These, these are words that mean weights or measurements. They also were the same words used for currency at the time. But he says that this is the interpretation of the matter. Many, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the, ba- and, uh, in the balances and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Your kingdom has come to an end. And that you, king, have been weighed and found wanting. You have been judged by God's standard, not your own standard, not anyone else's, but according to God's standard, you have been judged and found to be lacking. You've come up short. You have missed the mark. And at the telling of what these words means, we find out that the king at least is, is a, a man of his word. And he does give Daniel everything that he said that he would. He, he dresses him in this purple robe. He puts a chain around his neck. He makes him third in command over the entire kingdom. And then in verse 30, we see that God is a God of his word as well. That that very night, the medio persian Empire comes in and conquers Babylon, just as he said it would that this happened uh, 30 years after the Jewish people were taken into exile, or 70 years after the the Jewish people were taken into exile, just like God said that he would, as he keeps his word in this moment. So that's that's the story of Daniel chapter 5, but I really want to center our time around uh, Daniel's response in front of this king. He's called to come in front of this king and he spends his entire time, he spends this moment holding to what is true and all the while pointing Belshazzar back to God. He starts by recapping chapter four, uh, by, by telling the story of Nebuchadnezzar who in his pride thought he, that he was more than any other man, 
And yet God made him less to be, uh, less than a man, living like the animals. But what changed all of that, what restored him, what gave him back even more than he had before is when he turned and praised the most high God. That in that moment that he saw that it is God alone who is worthy of praise. God alone who has all authority. God alone who is magnificent. And while the king was trying to take all of that for himself, it was in that turning to God that restored him back to who he was. And Daniel tells the story and then he says to Belshazzar, but you don't need to be told all this. You don't need this reminder. You don't, you don't need any sort of history lesson. N- none of this is news to you. It's not some sort of revelation. Because this is what he, he says, or we read in verse 22. Daniel says to the king, and you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this. He says, though you knew all this. You've heard the story before. You, you would have been told about this traumatic incident in Nebuchadnezzar's life where he was living like an animal for seven years and you also would have been told what it is that restored him, relinquishing his pride, turning instead to the most high God. You knew all this. You knew that it was in responding to this God that, that this king was made even mightier than before. And yet here you are, boasting, throwing lavish parties, drunk in the face of death, thinking that you're untouchable, thinking that you have defeated the most high God when really you should know better. And this gets us to the sad truth that it's not enough to know. It's not enough to know about God or things about him or or the things that he's done, the stories uh, of who he is. It's not enough to know the facts or the figures. That for all of us as well, that, that even if we've, we've heard the, the stories of the Bible since we were kids, we've memorized parts of Scripture, we're, we're at least keeping up the national average of attending 1.7 Sundays of every month. Even if we're doing all of that, it's still not enough to just know about this God. Belshazzar had heard this incredible story of what God had done, of who God is, and he did nothing with it. He didn't live in response to this God. He didn't humble himself before him. He didn't praise the Most High God. He didn't live as God called him to. He didn't acknowledge the authority that God has and has alone. He didn't realize the truth that God can give kingdoms and take away kingdoms. He knew all of this about God and did nothing with it. I think the place that we're most reminded of that truth, that it's not enough to know, is when we look at demographic charts of church attenders. That as you look over the years, that that Christians, uh, as a national average, at least in America, uh, have been getting older and older. And what that means is that younger and younger people are either not attending church or leaving church. And, And this could be something that we have seen firsthand. Then, then maybe there's someone that we, we knew, we saw them growing up in the church and they seem to have real enthusiasm for who God is and what he's done of, of, of uh, following this God. And yet, if you were to talk to them now, they want nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the church. Maybe that's someone that we know. Maybe it's someone that we know really closely. And those are, those are hard moments when that's the case. And it's precisely because of that that we've been wanting to show a lot of attention as a church, a lot of care and support to our kids and to our students here. Not in any way to amplify them as the most important demographic in this church. No demographic is more important than any other. But it's because of that truth that we realize that it's not enough to know. And so we've, we, last Sunday, we, we had our child dedications as we acknowledge the gift that children are to their parents and how delighted we are that the parents who are up here are, are going to try to raise their kids up as God calls them to live, to pass along who God is and what he's done, but not just to know about God, but in an attempt that they would know God as well. <laughs> 
is why we have kids come and stand up on stage and we give them Bibles because we want them to, to not just be grasped by, by the words, by the content of what is in here, but to, be, uh, it's but to experience the God in whose words are contained within the Bible. It's why at the end of service, we're gonna draw attention to our graduating high school seniors who we want to acknowledge what they've accomplished and celebrate this tremendous feat that they've done and yet recognize that God is still working through them and we are eager to see what he might do in wherever they go next. We we do all of this. We we draw attention to our kids and our students uh, in all of this because, well, for one, the Bible calls us to pass along faith to the next generation, so we're we're all recognizing our part of, of being what, God has called us to do, but, but second, because we are so aware of the sad reality that it's not enough to know, that we might have people who've heard these stories and yet miss the God who's contained. But it's not just kids who do this as well. That, that there are, uh, that the people who leave the church had to have been, by definition, in the church at some point. So they've heard sermons, they've sang soft songs. They've gone to Bible studies. And it's why we've done this series, because it's far too easy to be wooed by the culture around us and away from the God who's given us life. It's it's far too easy to settle for something that looks like it's going to give us temporary benefit and miss out on, on the better story that God has for us, the better future that he has on hold. It's far too easy to hear these stories of abuse and disregard from Christians and churches, which I am not denying at all. Those are very real and unfortunate that they're real. But it's far too easy in those moments to assume that that those churches or those people, uh, that the God that they've been professing is not worthy of being followed. And all of these moments we see that it's not enough to know but I think that we still can have hope in these moments. And and when we look back at last week, which which this chapter is so focused on looking at Daniel chapter four, when we look at Daniel chapter four, I, I think there is a picture of hope. The overall story is that even Nebuchadnezzar, the the greatest king on the planet at the time, it's telling us that no one is beyond uh, humility. Not even one who thinks that they're safe or secure, who everyone would have looked on and been, ah, if only I could be like him. No one is beyond humility. But the other side of the story of Daniel chapter four is that no one, not even the most distant person, not even the person who's, who's seen God work before and has turned away from that. Not even someone who seems to have praised the most high God and doesn't actually follow him. No one is beyond repentance. I, I didn't get a lot of time to talk about it last week, but what, what I love, the, the part of chapter four that I love the most is in this vision that's given to Nebuchadnezzar. It's a real judgment-filled vision. There, there's this uh, great tree and it's gonna be cut down that you are gonna have your kingdom taken from you, O king. That, that you are going to, to lose your mind and become like an animal. You're gonna live amongst the animals for seven years, acting like a beast for seven years. And yet right in the middle of all that vision, there's this beautiful picture of grace. A stump remains. Cut down the tree, yes, but leave it stump so that it could regrow, so that it could flourish again. It's this incredible picture of grace that's given to Nebuchadnezzar, that in the midst of this judgment that he's going through, a stump remains. And I think that's the picture of grace that God gives to all of us, even those who should know better, even those who aren't praising the most high God, yet they've seen what he, what he has done. A stump remains. The means for growth is still there. Grace is on hand, even in the midst of judgment. But it, it made me ask this question, and I was, I was really struggling with this through this past week as we think about that picture of God's grace, what we have then in Daniel chapter five is Belshazzar, who we're told you should know better than this. It doesn't look like he is given that same grace. That instead he's told this very night, you will die and your kingdom will be taken from you. And it made me, I was asking the question, 
And so this is said to him because he should know better. He, he's heard these stories of what God has done. He, he should, you've known all this, so you should know better. But shouldn't Nebuchadnezzar have known better? Like this is a man who's had three chapters where he has seen God's work firsthand. Daniel chapter one, he, he gives this order for, for all of his people to eat the specific way and Daniel and his companions ask very politely, is it okay that we don't hold us accountable to it, test us to see how we're doing? And at the end of, of the set amount of time, they'll look at those guys and they look better than the other guys. And so clearly they're seeing God's working in their lives. There's something special that God's doing through them. And, and so they acknowledge their God in that moment. Daniel chapter two, this, this uh, vision from the king that no one can translate. And so he says, every wise man is gonna be killed, which includes Daniel and his companions. So they go before the king and says, uh, through God's empowerment, we could tell you what it means. And Nebuchadnezzar at the end of that chapter praises Daniel's God. Doesn't say the most high God, praises Daniel's God. Daniel chapter three, uh, the, the, again, another death threat that the, the Daniel's companions are not willing to respond to or worship the king. They're gonna remain faithful to their God, even when that means that they are gonna be thrown into the fiery furnace. And yet they're untouched, unscathed, un, uninfluenced by the fire. And it's clear that God has protected him in this moment. And so at the end of Daniel chapter three, Nebuchadnezzar praises their God. Not the God most high, but praises their God. Story after story of him seeing this incredible thing and associated it, associating it with this God. Shouldn't he have known better? And so why is he told that a stump remains and Belshazzar said, this very night you will die? What, what finally gave me some relief in here was when I was looking at other parts of the Bible. As we look at what uh, another part of the Bible tells us about God's character, we are reminded that God's character never changes. So who he, are, who he is in one place is who he will always be. And so when I was looking elsewhere in the Bible, I went to another place in the Old Testament uh, from the book of Jonah. If you know the story of Jonah, that's fantastic. If not, that's still okay. Uh, all you need to know about the book of Jonah right now is that it's about this man named Jonah, uh, who's called to go to this nation and give uh, this, this uh, warning of judgment upon them. And so uh, to really shorten the story, Jonah goes to this city and he tells them, in 40 days, you will be overthrown. There's no repent. There's no, if you turn to God, this will be stopped. There's no uh, follow him alone and you might be saved. The entire message is in 40 days, you're going to be overthrown. It sure doesn't seem like a stump remains there. That is certainty in that moment. And yet, the nation repents and they are saved. We see that even though this judgment was proclaimed on them, that there was still that grace of God to delay that judgment, that they still could turn to him. And that influences my reading here in Daniel chapter five, that even though Belshazzar has said, tonight you will be killed and your kingdom will be taken from him. He is still extended that same grace. That stump still remains for him. He still has the possibility to turn and follow this God, to repent in that moment. And yet he consciously chooses not to. Because what we see in that, that moment, how he responds, is he gives uh, rewards and a promotion to Daniel. He's told his kingdom will end in mere hours, and he uh, essentially is saying, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Look, I'm so confident that we will still be here that I'm going to give you this promotion that he is so uh, prideful in his moment, that he uh, assumes that he is still in control of these things, that he promotes Daniel uh, to this position, that he won't even have time to change his business card over to you before that position's taken away. And yet he's acting out of this pride. Nothing will touch me. There's no repentance, no turning to the grace of God that's offered to him. He instead is trusting in his power, his authority, his kingdom, and yet, it doesn't last. Now, this next part I had no intention of doing when I wrote all of this this past Thursday, which is a great start to things, I'm sure. Like, yeah, let's go off the cuff. Uh, but when I wrote on Thursday, uh, our, so I wrote this on Thursday, and then I woke up Friday to uh, some, some really awful news. Uh, that if you were with us last week as we were going through Daniel chapter four, I had this kind of off the cuff uh, 
uh, quotation uh, of a pastor that I've, I've really appreciated, uh, a man named Tim Keller. And uh, he, he's, he's a faithful pastor. He, he's been such an encouragement to me from a distance that in these times where it's wondering, man, how do I be a pastor? How do I care for the congregation that, that God has put in front of me? It, it's been a, his words have been a great encouragement to me uh, throughout. So even if you don't know who Tim Keller is, uh, you are the beneficiary of his ministry just through me being benefited through that. So I, I had this little little quote about him, and then uh, Friday morning woke up to the news that he had passed away. Uh, it's not something unexpected. He, he's been uh, dealing with, with cancer for the past four years, uh, and yet it still, it, it rattled me. It, it, it influenced my whole day. Uh, it didn't help that it was smoky and gloomy, uh, so my mood was already going to be down, but it, it was a really tough Friday. Delighted for him that he is relieved from his suffering. He is now with the Jesus that he has faithfully pointed people to his entire life. It's an incredible picture of faithfulness. And yet, so sad for me, for our, for our church, for the church in America, around the world that has been so shaped by him. So I figured, I had a quote from him last week. It, it only seemed fair following that news to quote from him again. And as people were sharing uh, stories of him and, and, and quotes that were impactful to him, uh, one came across my radar that, that not only works to, to close that loop, but also captures the idea of this passage so well that Belshazzar is trusting in all of these things, even to the point of his death, and missing the Most High God. And this quote that was posted two days before Tim Keller passed away captures that idea and captures what he so embodied throughout his whole life. He says, no family will always be there. No talent will always be there. Your looks certainly will not always be there. Whatever it is you put your anchor down into, whatever it is that you're looking to to have something to hold on to, something to give you support, some foundation to have, whatever you put your anchor down into, if it's a circumstance, well, that's like putting it into the water. There's nothing for it to latch on to. Everything but the promise of God is water. Belshazzar is this king who is trusting in all the works of his hand and it just disappears. But the grace that Daniel's been pointing to in all of this is that there is that sure foundation. There is something to hold on to and it's in the promise of God. But this book has also been pointing us to another grace as well. And it's for those who should have known better. It's for those who've heard about this most high God and yet aren't living lives of praise for him. And what we've seen in this book, what we see as part of God's character is that our God is slow to judge. A stump remains. Grace is extended. There is the means to repent and turn back to him, to trust and find that sure foundation in the promise of God. Which gets us to the second part of Daniel's response that I want to focus on. It's that our God is slow to judge, but he does judge. This whole chapter started with uh, the king uh, taking these, these objects that were in the temple before, that were used for the worship of God, that God called his people to make these things and keep them holy to use them in his worship. It, it is taking things that God has treasured and profaning them. This is what uh, Daniel says to him in verse 23. He says, Belshazzar, you have lifted yourself up, uh, lifted up yourself against the God of heaven. And the vessels of his house, the things that were in the temple, have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drank wine from them. And you have praised the God of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. You've been worshiping these gods who who do nothing for you. But the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored." So we see that that the king takes these things that were treasured to God and profane them. 
that this God who, who's in his hand and who controls your breath and your life and all your ways, you have completely ignored and rejected. You thought that you have defeated, you have taken things that he calls valuable, that he has treasured and treated them in such a profane way. I think we can recognize what the problem is there without too much expansion, but I, I do like how one of the commentators uh, flushed out the idea a little bit. He says, contempt for God's stuff is the same as contempt for God himself. He gives this uh, picture for us. If you arrive, let's say, at your office, he wrote this back in a time when people went into an office to work. Uh, if you arrive, let's say, at your office and find that your desk and chair and filing cabinets and briefcases and coffee maker and computer and pictures and knickknacks are all uh, sitting in the hall outside your office door, you immediately get the point. It's not merely that your stuff is out but that you are out. So contempt for God's stuff is the same as contempt for him. By, by taking things that are treasured by God and profaning this in this way, this is a king who is denouncing the most high God. But it goes further than that because this is God's stuff. It, it, when, when someone misuses things that are valuable to us, that, that hurts us because that is valuable to us. But when something is called valuable by, uh, to, by God, it is valuable. That is the baseline. God is the baseline of value. When, when we take something that God calls good, that is good. God is the baseline of goodness. It, it's not merely uh, upsetting God when we misuse his items, things that he says is val valuable. It is upsetting reality, creation, because by God saying it is treasured, it is valuable. It is and so we have this king who takes something that is called treasure by God and completely profanes it. And that is something that we still see to this day. As people think, take things that God has called good or valuable, that he has put worth into, that, he, that is something that he has given us, uh, which he gives us all good things, it is taking what God has given us and instead using it for a reason it was never meant to use, twisting it to fit our purposes, using it in a way it was never intended to elevate us rather than to elevate God. The, the most obvious example of this might be God's law that he has given us instruction on how we are to live that's for our good and for his glory. And yet we take that and we twist it or we ignore it. And we instead uh, create laws amongst ourselves, ones that elevate us, that, that uh, better benefit us. And whenever we accomplish something that we think uh, we ought to have, we, we champion ourselves in those moments. God has given every person value and dignity, and yet we abuse other people. We talk down to them. We make them feel less valuable. God has put his image in all people, treasuring all people, and yet we treat them as if the only value they have is one that contributes to society or to us, or that we get to dictate what's valuable, as we get to name what is our purpose, what is our value, what is our identity, taking what is given by God and shifting it, profaning it for something else. God has given us creation that he has declared as good, called for all people to, to rule over creation. And yet we twist it and pervert it to merely fit our needs however we see fit. God has given us marriage and sex. And yet we take those things and we get to repurpose them however we want to better fit our values, our satisfaction, our purposes. See, still to this day, we see this idea of taking these things that God has given us, God has called good, God has put value in, that he has treasured, and, and shifting it instead to something that we can name, that can serve us, that can fit our needs instead. It is taking something he has treasured and profaning it. And the writing on the wall is the same for, the, uh, for people who do that as well. Many, many, Tackle Parson, you have been weighed and found wanting. Now, I used a lot of, of them language there, talking about other people. Because when I get to chapters like this one that are so full of God's judgment, it's easy for me to think of the judgment that's coming out there to them. And yet in doing so, I miss what I think might be more important. I miss my saving. That this, this future is one that would have been mine as well that I too have taken the things that are valuable to God and profane them, use them to fit, fit my own needs, 
to elevate myself rather than him, taking things that he has treasured and making them uh, fit my purposes instead. And in that same instance, my future would have been the same as well. The writing was on the wall for me then too. Many, many tackle parson. I have been weighed and found wanting. And yet the beauty of the gospel is what we find in places like 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says, for our sake, he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin, even though he knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. See, what we see in this is that we who profane the things that God treasures are made to be his treasure because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That we have been weighed and the scales are forever tipped in our favor because of Jesus. That the stump that remains is bursting with life that we can be like Daniel and stand with confidence in the truth, not swayed by anything else, uh, that, that even when he is looking out and sees the enemy at the gates, that is going to destroy this place that he has called home for 70 years, that he can stand firm with boldness and truth and certainty because his anchor is not dropped in water, but he is firmly trusting into the promises of God. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so, so honored, so grateful that you continue to extend grace. That even as judgment comes, which we are glad that there is judgment. Not that pain is inflicted in people, not because it's easy to handle, but without that, there is no justice. Without saying that things are wrong, things cannot be right. Without being willing to restore what is broken, there is no hope for a future for us. And yet you do that with judgment. You've put into us a desire for order rather than chaos, for justice in a world where we rarely find that. And in the midst of this judgment, you also show great mercy and grace. That we who too have earned that judgment you have kept a stump. A stump remains. Grace is on hand. Repentance is available to all, even those who know better, even those who ought to be uh, worshiping the Most High God. There is still grace on hand. We are grateful for all of who you are, all of what you do, and we seek to follow you, not merely hearing about you, but living in response to all that you've done. So it's to you and you alone that we pray. Amen.